<laughs> Greetings all. My name is Brian Himmelbloom. I'm uh, a former governing board member of the Alaska Food Policy Council. Um, let me just check one thing really quick here. You are in session 1A. A is an apple. And we're going to begin with um, gonna be a, a one hour segment provided by uh, the group from Mazon out of LA. And I think I'm going to let you, or oh, 45 minutes. Thank you, Ravi. <laughs> Real time back of the back of the house uh, coordination. Really appreciate that because very savvy uh, at this uh, virtual conference. It's, it's so, so impressive how this is running. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Joey Hensler of Mazone and take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Joey. Uh, I am program manager for Mazone, a Jewish response to hunger. Um, and we really appreciate uh, the Food Policy Conference for this opportunity to introduce ourselves with so many stakeholders present uh, on this very impressive conference. This morning's plenary uh, was very powerful. Y'all have some really important uh, work and, and, and champions uh, that were on, on the call earlier. I wanna begin with our own land acknowledgement because we are joining you all from Los Angeles. So our team is currently on uh, Keech and Chumash land, land which is culturally significant and also the foundation on which food is cultivated, future generations are raised, community wealth is built and the sovereignty of a people is preserved. Uh, Mazone is committed to working with indigenous peoples by spotlighting issues and populations that face systemic barriers to food security, by sitting at the table and supporting the powerful work of native leaders, and by investing in the organizations and fighting for indigenous food sovereignty, traditional food ways, and food security for all peoples. Um, if you are unfamiliar with Mazone, um, we are a Jewish faith-based organization, and it is in that value uh, of our faith that, uh, you know, the worth of every human being uh, and the dignity that that sacred worth demands arises our call to action and our reason for being involved uh, in our advocacy. We work to change policy so that all of us have the food that we need to live happy, healthy lives no matter if we are black, native, or white, no matter if we live in a city or a rural community, and no matter how much money we have in our pockets, we all deserve the food we need. Um, our work at Mazone uh, is, is multi multitude. Uh, we have loads of impressive strategies at the federal level, uh, and we have seen success around our work to ensure uh, veterans and active military service members are not going hungry on bases while they are serving our country um, and many, many other federal priorities. We have faith-based organizing in synagogues around the country, uh, working um, in states on universal uh, free meal legislation. And we also have uh, partnership grants, which is my area of Mazone in 15 states in Puerto Rico. And in June, we will be making partner grants in Alaska. And our partners work on the ground to repeal barriers uh, to SNAP, whether it is drug felony bans that we have seen impacting disproportionately communities of color across our nation. Our advocates, our partners have repealed those kinds of barriers in Mississippi, Kentucky, West Virginia, and now they're at work in Kansas and Nebraska. We've seen um, our advocates achieve higher income limits for SNAP, uh, raising the limit to 200% federal poverty level in Louisiana, 165% federal poverty level in Nebraska. This means that not only tens of thousands of more food and secure households can gain access to food assistance through the SNAP program, but also that existing uh, households uh, can receive modest raises or promotions and still maintain 
the benefits that they need to help put food on the table. Um, our longstanding uh, relationships and collaborations with Native American advocates in the lower 48 inform our policy agenda and our perspective of food insecurity in Alaska. Nationwide, we know 42% of FDIPR households include older adults. We know at the national level, one in three families uh, that participate in the program include children. Uh, and we know that these challenges uh, and opportunities in Alaska are not the same at the national level. This nuance is the space that Mazone lives in with our partner grants. Uh, and when we partner and invest in leaders on the ground with the expertise in their own communities and their own states, this is the way to best, uh, this is the best way to meaningfully improve food security for everyone. Uh, and our grants are focused on states with challenging political environments where leading politicians are more likely to take food off the table of hungry folks rather than to legislate real pathways out of poverty. And so there's power in our network and we're excited to bring Alaska into the collaboration. Our national partners for over a decade have included the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative, the Intertribal Ag Council, the Native Food and Nutrition Resource Alliance, and the National Congress of American In Indians, and many non-Native policy shops and organizations. Um, and so we know that the lessons and expertise that we've gathered while working with these partners will be incomplete as we come alongside you all in Alaska. And so we are really eager to get in the game and to participate in this wonderful conference by presenting This Is Hunger. Uh, this Is Hunger is one of Mazone's educational programs. Uh, and I am going to hand it over to my colleagues now, Liz and Paul, uh, to introduce themselves uh, and to lead the rest of the session. Thank you so much, Joey. Uh, so my name is Liz Braun Lillenfeld. I'm the Deputy Director of Outreach for Mazon, uh, and I'm joined by Paul Sherman, who's our Outreach Manager. Uh, and we wanted to start this session with uh, just a little um, level setting. You know, as Joey was sharing, you know, we are a, a Jewish response to hunger, and and part of uh, our uh, mission is education uh, because we see uh, that you know having a, a common language around hunger is going to drive policy forward uh, that, that you know being being educated will build that political will that will see uh, equitable policy being realized uh, and so we want to start off with a hunger quiz no, that's just how you wanted to start your morning it was with the quiz but that's that's where we're going so um paul is going to uh share his screen uh and so this is going to give you the opportunity to participate with your cell phones or um or laptops or, or uh via the internet <laughs> so if you go to menti.com m-e-n-t-i.com um, and use this code right here 68320084 uh, then you will be able to participate. Uh, so we're, I think, Paul, maybe you'll be able to see if um, people are joining us. Uh, and, and so we'll give it a second to, uh, to allow you to hop on. If you have any issues, oh, actually, right. And as we do this, I'm remembering, we are seeing, seeing people participate as we speak, so that's great. Uh, if you have any trouble participating on here, feel free also to throw uh, answers in the chat. Um, but you see here, our first question is how many people in the United States are hungry or food insecure? Uh, and we have uh, 3 million uh, down at the bottom and 86 million uh, at the top. And so this is uh, for the whole United States, how many people are hungry or food insecure? And we'll give it a minute as people's uh, answers come in. And thank you so much for participating today. Um, this is also a heads up that we, we are hoping that we will foster a little discussion afterwards. So I hope you, are, you will, will join us in that way as well and uh, turn on your cameras and unmute, uh, but not quite yet. Uh, so I'll give it one more second, see if anybody else wants to jump on in here. Uh, to, to address this question. 
Okay, Paul, why don't we call it for now? We have two more questions. And so if you're still uh, still figuring out Menti, you can still participate. Uh, so our answer here is 38 million people. Uh, and I want to uh, expand on this a little bit uh, in that, of course, during the pandemic, we saw this number fluctuate a great deal. Uh, and that was partly due to a, a lack of data. Uh, you know, we were trying to catch up to what the trends were we were seeing and extrapolate from uh, the increase in unemployment uh, and and uh, and certainly the de de decrease in access uh, to benefits uh, and you know people who are food secure while uh, while on their benefits but but no longer had access for whatever reason if they couldn't. Uh, you know, get school lunches or whatever it may have been. Uh, and so Mazon was estimating uh, that during the pandemic, we saw a food insecure population of north of 65 million. Uh, and now it has resettled. We have come back to pre-pandemic numbers at the 38 million. Uh, but, you know, this is unconscionable as it stands. You know, pre-pandemic, during pandemic currently, this is wildly too many people uh, in our country who are food insecure. Uh, you know, we, this is a reflection of, of policy uh, that we have, we have failed uh, this group of people. It is not, it's certainly not a question of, um, uh, of access, or, or rather it's a question of access and not quantity of food. Uh, and so Paul, let's go to our next question. What is the most common way Americans receive food assistance? Uh, and so here we have food pantries or, or food banks, government programs, uh, which of course encompasses uh, SNAP or, or food stamps, uh, WIC, uh, the Dipper, uh, as the school lunch program and um, all, all other things that fall under that umbrella. Uh, then third, we have meal programs uh, and finally other catch-all. Uh, so what is the most common way Americans receive food assistance? And I'll give it a moment. I have to say, this is certainly a, a reflection of, of the room that we're in. Government programs so very rarely leads the pack. Okay, Paul, it's, it's uh, thank you. So government programs is it. Uh, certainly the most common way Americans receive food assistance is via government programs. Often uh, food pantries uh, and meal programs, the, the, the charitable uh, response to hunger is the most visible uh, of food assistance and, uh, and uh, can be, uh, for folks who are not participating uh, is, is the uh, most known, uh, but it is indeed the government programs that's, uh, that leads the pack. Uh, and our final question is going to be like, so, okay, so we've established that government programs is the most common way people receive food assistance, but by what percentage? Uh, you know, if you're looking at that pie chart, uh, what is the slice of the pie that government programs uh, covers. Uh, and so we have from 32% up to 95%. And I'll give it a moment. Okay, looks like answers have stopped coming in. Oh, oh, okay. So folks, uh, sorry, yes, this is, so I see a question in the chat, is this including SNAP benefits? Yes, uh, so uh, certainly as, as SNAP would fall under that, that umbrella of government benefits. Uh, and so 95% of food benefits in this country is met by uh, government benefits and, that number, I think, blows many people's minds. 
you know, we, it, it's, it's just that, that, that it is that significant, you know, that all of the charitable food programs in this country, from the massive uh, food banks to the pantry at a, uh, your, your local uh, church is, is, is meeting 5% of the assistance. And I, and, and I wanna be clear that we're talking about these systems and not the need, because that is a different question. Uh, but 95% is coming from government programs. And this means that any incursion on those government benefits is a huge blow uh, to both the people that are, uh, that are counting on these benefits and the uh, and everyone who is serving this community, uh, you know, we can't like we so often uh, there, there's a whole narrative about relying on the charitable food system that it is you know our duty uh, as individuals to to serve our neighbor and certainly that's a common uh, narrative in uh, the faith community. And, and it's a beautiful narrative. And certainly, uh, you know, we we don't want to take anything away from that uh, that deep sense of commitment and responsibility that we have to each other. However, it is uh, disrespecting the need that is there. It is disrespecting those individuals. It is disrespecting everybody who is trying to service that need if we take anything away uh, from those government programs because we're asking the Charitable Food Network to double, triple, quadruple uh, their entire outputs. Uh, and so it is, and so that's where organizations like ours come in and why we are dedicated to focusing on advocacy, uh, because it, we feel it is our duty to protect uh, the government programs to increase access, to increase their, uh, the, the benefits themselves, uh, so that we can, um, you know, because that they, only the government has the tools, has the resources, uh, to address an issue of this scale. Uh, and so I promised my colleagues that I would look at the time and I absolutely have not in the last few minutes. So uh, we need to we'll shift to our, um, to our program of this hunger. Uh, a very, very brief introduction. Um, a number of years ago, we invited a photojournalist to travel the US and interview people experiencing food insecurity. Uh, and these are their stories. We went, we featured six individuals and their experiences with food insecurity. Uh, and you will see their images and their voices uh, because we believe that we should, uh, one, uh, to, to highlight voices of, of people of experience, uh, to uh, and to, to give life to this issue. Uh, and so I thank you so much for giving your time uh, to hearing these experiences. And we'll talk a little bit afterwards about uh, how this has and hasn't changed through, through the pandemic. Uh, and also how these stories here do or don't reflect the experience of Alaska. Uh, you know, I will be uh, frank in that these stories were culled from the lower 48. Uh, and we know that there are particular challenges in Alaska and in regions of Alaska that are unique. Uh, and so certainly that's a part of the story of Hunger of America that we want to uh, be telling and uh, to, to kind of create a fuller picture. And so we, we're excited to hear your comments and, and see if we can bring those into our education in the future. Uh, and so with that, Paul, I will we'll get started. I was one of these people that thought, you know, I'd I'd work my 30 years and retire and live happily ever after. People don't realize, you know, what you got until it's gone. My life now as a senior citizen is probably harder than any of our other lives with the working, the raising of children. We're pretty much isolated here.
My mom's been working 20 something years in the school system. She had the job, everything was fine. When I was in my 40s and 50s, I had no idea that this would happen. I thought when I turned 65, I would be living a good life. I always thought I could have a job and be able to progress in my job to be able to provide for my family. And I could list the different skill sets that I had in the military, but a lot of those skill sets don't translate into civilian life. My childhood was a very beautiful childhood. My mom was used to always getting us what we wanted. It wasn't the best, best house ever, but it still was ours. You know how they can be hungry in America? Because they've lost their jobs. They've depleted their retirement savings that they've had. They've lost their homes. For all my life, since I was 17 years old, I've served my country, been responsible, reliable, dependable, accountable. I went to work every day, did what I was supposed to do. Now I'm faced here, worried about feeding my family, and we shouldn't have to do that. It makes me feel sometimes like a, like, a, like a garbage can out there just waiting to be picked up and dumped. It really does. All this stress, all this pressure. I'm a nerd. I collect toys. I've always been a kid at heart. I fell in love with working with kids and helping kids. I wanted to become a teacher, but it's a small royal town. It's actually falling apart. People aren't moving in, they're moving out. The community's getting smaller and smaller. And a lot of my problem is, is I'm such a family person that I don't want to move away from my mother and my dad. I feel like I'm not fixing meals that are nourishing. It is not the thing to do, I know. But if you have to have your meds to keep you alive, you're gonna pay for them and try to do the best you can with what food you can get. It makes a person feel depressed. The senior meals are a blessing. You know, I like to eat unlike anybody else, but we're not generally able to afford healthy foods that some people can. When you go and you're used to having food to eat and then there's nothing there, it's, it's We've got canned food in there that's probably older than me that we've had to open up and eat. Going to bed hungry gives you that feeling that you, you got to get up and eat. You, you, it keeps you from sleeping, really, it does. It's not a good feeling at all. My mother has nights when she can't sleep either, just of the thought that she doesn't have a job and she thinks she can't provide and she can't live with herself. It's not something anybody would want to go through. In 1957, at the age of nine, we moved the first time from one plantation to another. When I was a child, we had more, more food, more meats than I have now. 
I changed the way I eat because I don't have the money to buy what I used to buy. Now, not being able to feed myself the way I would like to, I cook to fill me up, not so much as healthy. I always try to eat healthy, and I'm on cholesterol medicines now. We had a two-bedroom house in a country club garden. We couldn't keep up with the payments. My mom, she bought us one instead of paying the mortgage. It was very hard at first, like, uh, I don't want to take care of my sisters, but my mom's getting sick and I couldn't work. She got stamps, but with three kids, it doesn't last the whole month. Kids eat a lot. We're like, okay, don't eat as much. We have to make the food last. Don't ever think this can't happen to you or your family. I mean, I had a great UAW job making $100,000 a year almost with overtime. It's gone. It's gone. And all the other things that were attached to it are gone. Health care, life insurance. And now I'm stuck here trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I used to help people out with delivering food assistance. I'd never lived above my means. We used to go out to dinner a lot, you know, as a family. My wife cooks meals now that'll probably uh, last a few days longer. I mean, uh, never thought I'd be like that. It's a scary world we live in today. It really is. I never really had to rely on the system to support me that much because I always felt that was wrong. I feel that there's people more deserving of that than me. I decided to apply for food stamps because of my family. I have a wife and a son, and I'm not able with my job to support them. I don't want to have to be doing the food stamp program, but it's for those families that aren't able to make it on their income. We were skipping meals so we could feed our baby. I have high blood pressure, and you have to be careful for that. But salads and fresh vegetables, we just don't consume unless they are out of a can. I bought a little carton of tomatoes out here to the store not long ago, which was two eighty nine dollars for just a few tomatoes in one of them little plastic things. Cut them very small and used very few at a time, just like almost enough to give you a taste. Mm -hmm. You don't have an understanding to either there. But you know what? What happened to me can happen to anybody. It seemed like to me, once you get a certain age, you tossed aside. I never would have thought America would be like this. It affects your parents. It affects how you act. It affects how you work at school. It makes you feel like you're not normal. It really does. It's, it's not something somebody should have to live with in their life. And there are kids right now, younger than me, having to go through it. Whoever can help with these programs, please do so. Because there's a whole bunch out there, a whole lot of people out there that I'm sure are hungry. You ever heard people talk about they're standing in line in the grocery line and somebody pulls out the, the bridge card and they've got a fur coat on? You ever heard things like that? I always thought I was, you know, living a pretty fair life. Six. That comes out to about 90 cents per person per meal. It's less than $18 a day. 
I to feed the family. And even apply for public assistance. It's not your finest moment when you never food. And here you have people that have lived their whole lives working in the in, in United States of America that, that have no food. No, demand an accounting. Demand that people be held accountable for their actions. I kind of wish I, you know, I could scrape up some type of food to get um, a decent meal. Um, if I had to add anything to this, it would be to um, get off of government assistance. You'll never ever be able to control what happens to you. You can think about it all day long, you can plan for it. The only part you can control is how you react. So get involved, whether it be standing up for what you believe in, uh, demonstrating, advocating, bringing awareness, food pantries, food assistance, healthcare, whatever the case may be. Do something. From going to a very comfortable life to a struggling life, it made me think there's lots of injustice in the world. Change starts by one person. So I want to be that change in the world. So thank you all for taking some time to watch those stories, listen to those stories with us. Uh, so I just wanted to invite any reflections that you might have, uh, you know, whether it's something that resonated with you uh, from, from that video or uh, something that you see is missing from that narrative, whether uh, certainly, you know, as I shared before, uh, this was, uh, curated before the pandemic. Uh, and so we, we certainly know that uh, the circumstances uh, in which some people found themselves uh, uh, experiencing food insecurity have changed, although often uh, the stories can be quite similar. Uh, so there's, there's that track. Uh, and then certainly the differences uh, that we could generate from this room uh, of what the experience might be in Alaska than from the lower 48. Uh, and and because you know we see it as our job as educators to bring uh, the that experience to everyone that, that we encounter. Uh, and so we'd love to uh, to hear from the folks in this room. And certainly not to put anybody on the spot, but I heard from our colleague that we have some of our uh, legislative champions in the room from our, our partners. Uh, and so I know that there's a great deal of expertise here uh, to that we could share if you are so willing. Uh, so, and I know we've had uh, some comments coming up in the chat. Uh, Claire, I did want to call you out. I'm so, I'm so pleased uh, that you've been participating um, and we're so glad to to hear from you is that you're the program director at St. Francis House Food Pantry in Anchorage, uh, and you're sharing some uh, some of the ways SNAP can be utilized in Alaska. Uh, that's but please, if there are any any folks who want to uh, either unmute and uh, and comments or put your comments in the chat, we'll give you a moment to do that. And I should have the power to unmute people. I, I can't remember what kind of controls we have on this because thank goodness we don't have any Zoom bombing going on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, people raise their hands. I'll, I can try to look across the screen or um, uh, I'll let people just try to unmute themselves. And if you have a problem, <laughs> oh, oh, thanks, Robbie. Uh, everyone is able to unmute themselves. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes before this session ends. So go ahead, people. <laughs> and certainly, and if, if you want to uh, to mull a bit, we, we also have 
uh, one more activity that we wanted to uh, share with everyone and then we can come back to a QA and a at the end if you have questions about this program or about our work uh, or want to uh, share anything with us about yours. So why don't, why don't we, we can make that switch now. So Paul, if you want to yeah. uh, share our meal planner. Absolutely. Oh, we do have a question from Steven. Oh, how do we hear about the Alaska Food Policy Conference? Well, <laughs> uh, our colleague Joey, that's how. <laughs> so um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hold that for now so that Joey can pop back on for the Q&A at the end and, um, and, and share that connection. Sounds great. So uh, hopefully everybody's able to see uh, the activity that's on my screen and let me know if anything is too small to read. Um, but basically for this activity, what we're going to do is we're going to ask everybody to essentially act as if you're in the grocery store uh, preparing a meal for yourself. Um, you'll see five categories here. We have vegetables, grains, fruits, protein, and dairy. Um, so what we ask is that you just pick one food item from each category and sort of on your, uh, by yourself, if you have a pen and paper, or maybe just on a, you know, electronic notepad, or if you are a numbers person and you can do basic math in your head, that's great too. Um, just choose one item from each category and then calculate your total meal costs. And once you have that, if you could um, just put your total meal costs in the chat, that would be great. And we will, um, we'll go from there. So we'll give everybody a moment uh, to do, to do this. Uh, I did want to share, you know, like, you know, as we've been saying, um, we know this isn't reflective of many regions. Uh, in your state. Uh, we actually are doing a, um, a digital version of this activity as part of uh, a new endeavor uh, for Mazon, which I will um, give you a little sneak preview into. We are creating a hunger museum, uh, which will debut later this year, we hope. Uh, it will be an all digital experience, but it's going to be sharing the story of hunger over about the last hundred years. Uh, and um, how it has been um, addressed via policy and, and kind of what, what our history tells us about where we should move our policy forward. Uh, and this, this activity will be part of that experience and we hope to do a number of skins of it. Uh, and I think it would be really fascinating to do, a, uh, to do something that reflects food prices and food access in Alaska. Uh, and so, you know, if you're doing this and you're going like, this is, produce doesn't cost as much or whatever it is, then, then one, we'd love to hear that feedback. Um, and two, we hope to reflect that um, in another iteration of this activity. And, you know, we, we realize that Alaska has its own uh, special circumstances for reasons why food prices are so high, you know, even just across the continental U.S., prices fluctuate state by state, and obviously it depends on you know, at the time we realized that prices are higher than ever right now. Um, and that, you know, in Alaska alone, there are certain, you know, challenges of getting food to remote areas. Um, so absolutely, it would be really fascinating to see, um, you know, an activity like this that reflects those prices. Um, yeah, and I see orange some... does not cost oh, 33 ahead. cents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but so I see, I see some people have um, are starting to have their meal prices. We have dollar uh, sixteen, dollar seventy six, a lot in a lot in the dollar seventy range. Uh, I see one three fifty in here too. No, oh, indeed. Uh, and so, of course, the the purpose of this activity is to reflect on what the SNAP allotment is, and so the. Uh, when we when we wrote this, uh, the average SNAP benefit per person per meal was a dollar forty, uh, and what we've seen in the with the um, pandemic and the recent increases is now it's a dollar eighty. Uh, so that's it's a very modest increase and it's a vital increase. Uh, and so you know as, as advocates, we all have to hold both of these things at once. That it is both a huge win and it is not enough by any means. Uh, and so this activity is something that we bring uh, to our education spaces, uh, but we also bring it to legislators. 
uh, you know, to really make it uh, clear uh, what, uh, what the struggle is. And uh, so often, you know, we'll do this activity and then we have postcards that have, have it on the fronts and we invite people to write their legislators and tell them, we just did this activity. You know, this is a, a reflection of the struggles that folks who are food insecure are having. And like, can you do this? Can you have a meal that you wanna eat? Does this meet all of your needs? Uh, and, and for us as a, you know, as a Jewish organization, we come to this work from a base of uh, a kind of a values orientation. Uh, and for us, you know, we constantly come back to it's not just about feeding people, it's about feeding people with dignity. It's about meeting people's uh, whole needs, uh, you know, so that they're eating what is meaningful to them and what is uh, re reflective of their culture and of their family and of their celebrations. Uh, and so a, a modest snap that is just getting calories in people's bellies and not even that, you know, people's um, staff benefits are running out after two or three weeks into the month. Uh, but that the goal is not just enough food, the, the goal is eating with dignity. Uh, and so I, but I, I see the chat going off, so I don't want to lose any, any comments there. Um, but, and I'm also noticing the time, uh, I, I want to shift us to Q&A if there are uh, any any questions that have uh, come up from from this activity, from this is hunger about our work generally? Okay. Oh, to, oh go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Just want to say uh, there's about two minutes left, mm -hmm. so it's going to be a, a flash round for everybody. So um, just step up to the mic and and post your question if it hasn't been addressed already, or just put it in the chat and then we can deal with that later. Thanks. And so we can I, also, for any, oh, sorry, go ahead, Liz, I'll, I'll say this after. Oh, I was just saying, I see Stephen was commenting about doing a SNAP challenge in a community nutrition class. Uh, and, and, and certainly, you know, the, those experiences can be really eye-opening. And of course, it's only part of the picture, you know, and, and our, this, this activity is just part of the picture. You know, if, uh, you know, if people need to drive 40 miles to uh, get to a store that's, um, then you know where where how is gas reflected how is all of these things um and you know what what is your time to uh uh in your ability to cook meals and uh between jobs or without child care uh and so forth and so there there's all of these all of these nuances that we can only partially capture uh but but paul you were gonna say I was just going to say, and I'll type this out as well. We'll we'll provide our email addresses so that if anybody has any follow up questions or anything that we're unable to get to in this short time frame, we'd be happy to connect with you separately. Uh, Genevieve asks, "Who looks at nutrition content?" And I think uh, the fallback on that is the USDA. I don't think Mazone is doing nutritional content or nutritional labeling, um, but I do see Claire has her hand up. Claire, can you unmute yourself? Hi, y'all. Yeah, my name's Claire. I, I run a big food pantry in Anchorage. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for your time and add a couple comments that um, I really liked how the video covered uh, the situation with um, elder food insecurity, um, which is a major thing we see at the food pantry in Anchorage. I know it's just even more dramatic in rural Alaska as well. Um, and then add that, um, oh yeah, for sure, at the pantry, we see our numbers get busier at the end of every month and people mm -hmm. self-report that that's because SNAP benefits don't go far enough. Um, so just kind of corroborating that story. And then a final comment I had, um, I'm sure you guys are talk talking with all the right people on this stuff, but um, I find that language access in Alaska for SNAP benefits is um, a huge, huge need. So that's what I have for now. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thanks Thank for that great note. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Liz. Um, we're at 11 o'clock. Uh, let's have a great round of virtual applause for Mazone. I think the first time you presented at, at uh, AFPC, we look forward to your great work, constant progress, and uh, maybe we'll see you at the next, at the seventh conference, which will be in 20, late 2023. 
Thank Thanks. you, Mark. What a concept. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. And thank you, everybody, for your active participation. Thank you, everyone. We're so grateful to be here. Uh, so with that, um, I'm trying to transition here virtually. Let me just check my schedule. We are now going to move on to our uh, session 2A, if I, if I have my program right here, uh, on uh, Farmers Market Coalition. I believe Ben Feldman, uh, also from out of state, yay, uh, will be presenting uh, his talk. Um, ben, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let's see if I can get my slideshow up here real fast. Um, let's see, can you all see that? Can I get a thumbs up from someone or just in, all right, looks like y'all can see my slideshow, great. Um, so again, uh, my name is Ben Feldman. I'm the executive director here at the Farmers Market Coalition. Um, happy to be here talking to you about gearing up for um, the 2023 Farm Bill. Um, some of you may remember me from um, a presentation I did last year. I managed to try and, uh, well, I, I managed to cook dinner and um, talk to you all about the Farm Bill at the same time. Um, I hope some other folks enjoyed that. I certainly did. Today's conversation will be a little bit more um, calm, a little less frenetic, but um, hopefully we'll cover some good information. So my plan for today is that we'll, um, we'll do a little bit of a refresher um, about the Farm Bill, what's included in it, what, um, why it's important, what it's not. Um, we'll get some feedback on um, your experiences with the Farm Bill programs and something of a listening session. Um, we'll reveal, um, well, I shouldn't say reveal, it makes it sound uh, um, like it's um, something that's been behind curtains or something, but um, we will share FMC's policy priorities. Um, certainly interested in your feedback on those priorities. Um, and, and then we'll, um, we'll go ahead and move into a little advocacy exercise um, for the end of um, the, the last little bit of that, um, that conversation. So um, before we go ahead and get started, I wanna ask um, a question of all of y'all. Um, the fir that first question is, have you contacted your member of Congress in the past? If so, what about? Um, and then a prompt for you to think about as we prepare for the end of the session, we'll, we'll do this little advocacy exercise, um, and I'll drop this in the chat in just a second. Um, what are you most proud of about um, your market, your farm, um, your work that you do as part of this, and what evidence do you have for that? Um, you're welcome to put that in the chat, um, but I want to start with this first question. Um, you know, what um, you know, have you contacted your member of Congress before? Um, I'd love to see, you know, whether folks have experience contacting their members of Congress, um, and if so, you know, what topics they've contacted them about. Um, so feel free to do that, um, or if folks want to come off, raise your hand, come off mute, however you want to do it, just kind of curious what the level of um, experience here with uh, the Farm Bill and policy advocacy is. Have we got anybody willing to share with us um, about their experience? If the answer is no, that's okay too. Hey Ben, this is Robbie. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. You've got some good echo behind you though. Um, I'll just type it in. Thanks Robbie, um, appreciate that. And if other folks, um, um, Robbie's saying she's contacted directly through email and through forms. Um, oh, a great question. Um, whether, whether which is more effective via email or fill in forms. I'm happy to just answer that now before, and we can also take other questions as they come. Um, in general, if you have direct contact to someone in a member of Congress's office, that's your best bet. 
Um, phone calls and letters are generally preferred over email or email forms. And then emails, again, if you have a specific name at someone at an office, that's a great way to do it. Um, sounds like other folks um, maybe um, have also done some contacting of their representatives through letters and um, looks like um, John here, yeah, great. Um, so thanks for getting that started. If other folks have experience, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and keep moving. Um, so the, the piece next for us, um, I've got some advocacy tools that Farmers Market Coalition um, can share with you all. Um, if you join us at farmersmarketcoalition.org slash advocacy, we've got um, all these tools listed. I'm not gonna go into them, but while that slides up, I just wanna um, take a minute to talk about why we do policy advocacy, um, why it's important. And, um, you know, really from my perspective, um, the, you know, the, the purpose of um, our political system, you may hear people say, um, you know, our political system is not broken, it's functioning, uh, functioning exactly as it's intended. Um, and, you know, what do we mean when we say that? Um, that basically means that our political system was designed um, to keep those with money and power with money and power. And so um, for those of us who are not part of that system, the only um, antidote that has really proven to be effective um, at combating the role of money and power in politics is people coming together, working um, in, in solidarity and in coalition um, to support and uh, each other and to man demand the things um, from their government that they feel as though they need. Um, and so you know, that is the approach um, that I take when I work in, in policy work. Um, and you'll sometimes hear things about you know the um, the ability to participate in politics and and or people feeling as though it can be distasteful or that you know that it doesn't achieve anything and um, you know I'm here to say that um, we, you know we see time and time again examples of where people being able to do this coming together and advocating for their needs achieves outcomes and and when it we leave it um, alone there is a you know an obvious orientation to our system so um, that said um, let's jump into what the you know what the farm bill is what it's all about and why you know i feel like we have some good opportunities here with the work that we're doing um, so just a refresher you may be familiar with this um, farm bill um, uh, President Barack Obama a number of years ago referred to it um, saying it's like a Swiss army knife, which is a pretty good analogy because it does many different things. It's not just um, the farm bill, it's the food and agriculture bill, but it also in, um, addresses health and nutrition and research infrastructure, a number of the things that are represented here. Um, other people have gone on to um, extend the analogy because um, the farm bill is like a Swiss army knife in that it does lots of things um, without being maybe the best tool for any of the job, but it's the one that we have. Um, for the work that we do at the Farmers Market Coalition and, and the work that many of you all do, um, the programs that um, we're, I should say, that we're really most directly involved in at the Farmers Market Coalition, um, the SNAP EBT, which is the biggest farm bill program of all, um, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, um, the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, sometimes shortened to GUSNIP, um, which used to be the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program. And this is the program that funds all of those wonderful doubling programs for EBT. Um, and then we've got the group of programs known as the Local Agricultural Marketing Program. And for our purposes, that in particular includes the Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program. Um, for those of you who work on um, WIC or school nutrition issues, you'll note, of course, that um, the Farm Bill does not include um, any of the WIC or farm to school programs. Those are contained um, within a, a different piece of legislation and um, it creates some, some odd challenges in terms of working across these different pieces of legislation. Um, and we're mostly here today to talk about the farm bill. So um, the, in terms of the farm bill process, um, it's a long process. We are current uh, currently working towards the end of the um, farm bill that will expire in the end of September, 2023. Um, but because it is such a massive piece of legislation, the process begins, begins a long um, time in advance. Um, the first real stage in that process is our hearings in the House and Senate Ag Committees, which, and that's pretty much where we are right now. Um, we'll also see listening sessions where members of Congress come out to um, listen to folks out in their communities. 
Um, these can be a great opportunity to get your voices heard. Um, at the same time, it's a little bit of a cattle call type situation. Um, you've probably got three minutes and maybe one of hundreds of people who are talking. Um, and then out of these pre pieces um, and information that members of Congress um, receive from um, the field and their constituents, um, they'll develop marker bills, which are um, pieces of legislation that aren't really intended um, to pass on their own, but sort of carve out a piece of territory for the member of Congress um, in terms of what is important to them to see in the final bill. And then all of those things will come together with everything that was sort of in the last farm bill that doesn't get changed. Um, the House and Senate will each pass their own version. Um, and then they'll come together in a, a conference committee. Um, and ideally, it all gets done before um, the current farm bill expires in September, September 30th, 2023. Um, but the last two farm bill cycles, uh, it has expired. So um, reasonable to expect that that could happen again. Um, a little bit of a refresher on um, what happened in the last farm bill in terms of the work that we all do as it relates to farmers markets um, and local food. Uh, you, you, uh, if we go back to this slide here, um, these programs that are these grant programs that are part of what's now known as the local agricultural marketing program prior to the current farm bill were all separate grant programs with their own individual funding. Um, by bundling those programs together into the local agricultural marketing program, uh, we were able to get what's known as baseline funding for these programs, um, which is a little bit inside baseball, but it's important because basically what it means is that these programs are presumed to continue if the farm bill either expires, as we um, just talked about, or into the next farm bill um, in uh, instead of having to fight to get them into the bill at all. Um, a 25 match, 25% 25 match requirement was added to the Farmers Market Promotion Program grant. So that is um, applicants who are applying for these grants now are required um, to put up a quarter of the total program costs uh, in from their own budget. Um, that can be volunteer or in mat, in kind match, um, but it is a real, um, as Robbie's pointing out in the chat, it can be very prohibitive, um, particularly for smaller organizations, organizations um, who may not have as many resources. Um, it can be a real barrier. So um, that's something that was new in the last farm bill, which we were not um, in favor of. Um, and then there was in particular, there was language directing USDA to resolve the, an issue that has been um, a challenge for markets in um, for quite some time, and that is um, basically trying to come directing USDA to come up with a pathway for markets um, to market operators to accept SNAP using one machine and one FNS number across multiple locations. Um, and that's something that has not has not been a, a ton of progress on, unfortunately. Um, so. The um, USDA ha has been looking into this issue since the last uh, farm bill. And while they certainly have had other things um, on their minds, uh, we know that this is a priority for our community. So um, with that in mind, I'd love to go ahead um, and open it up. If folks have experience with any of these programs, um, you know, what, has, what has your experience been? What problems might have you might have you seen in in trying to work with some of these farm bill programs? Um, are there changes that you could see making to make them better? And then if you've got more like clarifying questions or strategy questions, happy to to get into those. And then the next thing we'll do is we'll we'll take a look at the FMC policy priorities uh, and and get kind of reactions to those. So curious if if anybody um, either wants to put in chat or um, raise their hand, open it up. And everyone should have the ability to unmute themselves. So uh, Brad, go ahead, you have your hand up, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Hey, What's I just up, had Brad? a question um, about EWIC and yeah. uh, where that fits in and funding for markets or uh, folks that are we taking EWIC coming up, that change is coming. And hi, Ben. <laughs> hey, Brad. Um, yeah. So, you know, EWIC is one of those programs that's not farm bill related, but it's worth delving into for a second because we've got like a coming um, 
like Wick is about to get sandwiched between a rock and a hard place here. Uh, what you know, we're seeing um, the move to electronic WIC. Uh, states are mandated to move to eWIC for the broader program, um, and that change um, is is basically you know we're all of the last states are coming online with that here um, imminently. Um, we the WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program is not required to go electronic, um, and we have been encouraging states to keep that as the at the paper vouchers as long as possible because there are, frankly, if we're being honest, there's no good electronic WIC solutions available for the farmers market field. Um, they are being piloted in a few states, but the outcomes so far have not been great. Um, for all of the reasons you can imagine, right? The, all of the same challenges the SNAP program faces. And then there's an added hurdle that there's no legislative, no legal authority to do what the SNAP programs do with the tokens. So there's a real problem there. The, the thing that's changing now that's making the situation potentially more problematic is um, the banking institutions that support the paper checks in a number of states, and I'm, I'm seeing you nodding and maybe Alaska is one, um, are phasing out their support for that. So um, if that's something that folks want to talk about, um, we'd be happy to, maybe we could um, spend some time strategizing on that if it's um, something that's of current concern. We're seeing Kentucky is definitely a state where this is like really coming to a head and, and it's gonna happen this year where they're gonna push to do an electronic WIC FMNP program without any pilots. The only place we know like that have done pilots recently has been New Mexico. So um, that's gonna be a place for everybody to be looking as they um, move into their second year. That was my second question. Who can we connect our state reps with? Another state that's really figuring out New Mexico. In yeah, um, New Mexico, and, and uh, if I said Tennessee, I misspoke Kentucky, um, but Kentucky is not going to be a model, um, just to get, say that, because they haven't even, as of as, as far as I know, they have not even let their um, markets know that it's going to be happening for this season. So you can already see like how problematic that is. At least, at least in New Mexico, they've allocated funding to support um, the transition uh, at the state level, but um, the technology and the, the barriers just aren't quite there. Or barriers are there, and the technology isn't. Excuse me. So we can happy to talk more about that if that's on of people's uh, of interest to people um i will go ahead and start putting up fmc's policy priorities just recognizing that we've got uh, and i should say legislative priorities for the farm bill and the reason um i say that is um this doesn't include our work at the say with individual states um through some of our, our state partners or work that we may be doing with the administration. Um, and, I'll, and I'll explain why that's the case in just a minute. So um, some of this stuff may look familiar to some of you um, if you've participated in some of our previous um, conversations around this. Overall, our goal is to make um, federal grant programs that are, are used, are commonly used in farmer's market settings, um, make them make easier to access um, and provide additional support to grantees, um, particularly for organizations um, and farmers who have not had access to these grants in the past um, or have had barriers to them. Um, notably in the, the LAMP grants, this means a simplified application process um, and working with our partners um, in DC, notably the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Um, we're working to try and figure out what that actually looks like. Um, it can be challenging to tell, um, to put in language in the farm bill to say simplify applications, because what does that, that mean in practice? Um, so at this point, we're exploring the possibility of using um, something that's modeled in the farm to school grants, what are called turnkey grants. And what is what they are essentially is as a way to create um, model programs, as it were. So for example, what, you know, maybe the five most common FMPP applications um, would sort of, you'd have a template already in place with a set of questions that need to be answered um, and a budget that sort of has pre-identified um, areas of spending in order to make the plot process to apply much simpler. And there's, you know, it's still a government application, so there'd still, you know, be pieces to it that would be challenging, but really taking that down um, for grants under 
a you know set dollar amount at this point, we're probably looking at a hundred thousand um, dollars, maybe a little bit more than that for these simplified grants. Um, reducing this this match or eliminating the match requirement, um, that's something that we are hearing that there may be some um, greater political opposition to than some of the other pieces, um, and then. Funding for training, um, outreach, and support activities. Again, trying to model this off other um, federal programs, like what we are seeing um, developed in some of these grant programs, where they create centers that are designed to support grantees and potential grantees as they go through these these application processes and the execution of their grants, so that they can do them more effectively towards the goals of the program, but also so that they are. Um, more equipped to understand what it is and what is involved in applying for and then administering a federal grant because sometimes, not sometimes, often we see these organizations um, take on grants without really understanding what it means to administer one and that is that is easily can easily be as much work as applying for and doing the programmatic work, just going through um, and the regulations to make sure that you comply, that your policies are in order, um, and then you know that making sure you don't run afoul of things. And then on the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, um, really advocating for the important role of direct and local agriculture within the program. It's really how incentive programs began um, with, with a group of, of doubling programs that got started largely in response to um, the, the exodus of, farmer, of, of people using SNAP to shop at farmers markets after the SNAP program went electronic. Um, and so that's really been a priority of ours and really has been where the program started. The majority of um, incentive programs uh, have over the course of their history been at farmers markets and still farmers markets um, do nearly half of the incentives um, nationwide. So making sure that that farmers markets and other direct uh, mechanisms are not left out of the Gusnet program as it continues to grow and expand. And, and that includes addressing some programmatic um, challenges. I don't, again, kind of inside baseball, I don't need to get too much into it, but for those of you who, who were following it, there was um, some challenges around the last request for applications um, that sort of had a mechanism that would have made it hard for market and market operators um, to participate in that program. Luckily, we were able to get that changed um, within the RFA, but we want to we want to take that to the policy level and make sure we aren't having to fight for that every year as the RFA comes out. So those are our Farm Bill priorities. Um, again, curious how folks there in Alaska are thinking about these pieces of it, um, what questions you might have, whether they fit with your experiences in these programs, um, any feedback that you all might have for us. And again, uh, for the audience, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand or place it in the chat. So a variety of avenues for you. I'm okay with a little, uh, little silence here um, <laughs> as we give people a time to process and ask any questions. Brad again. No. Go, Brad. So what is like the ideal match that we're trying to reduce it to? Like what is what's the percentage that we think is like functional for organizations for the LAMP grants? Did you already touch on that, what you're looking to drop it to? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, realistically, I, I think the way we, we get at this is probably, again, a tiered approach and that um, you know, if, if we could get rid of the match requirement for these smaller dollar amounts, I think that would be a pretty significant victory. Um, and, you know, if the, the thing is there's, um, and yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a argument to be made that for smaller, um, lower dollar grants, the match is a particularly significant barrier. Um, and so that it, that may be how it plays out. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, we'd like to see the match eliminated across the board for FMPP programs, um, whether that's something that's going to, we're going to be able to move that politically, I'm not totally sure. Uh, 
Uh, ben, this is Brian. I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, as we're coming out of COVID and a lot of the ARPA mon uh, monies have been used to supplant things, um, do you see some kind of, um, I don't know, challenging situation where people have shifted um, into pandemic uh, relief and then may have um, been led, led astray maybe because of all the um, challenges of, of running that program and then now flipping back to these established um, programs from the federal government. I've, have you heard from people who are just, you know, probably just, just really burnt out? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, you know, the, another question, you know, sort of for folks, if folks have experience with the, um, the latest, you know, the pandemic response grants, the PRS grants that have just um, started to finally flow um, obviously, that was something that was supposed to be a simple process um, and has gotten more complicated. Um, you know, my response to that is um, it's, it, there's been a lot, I think, for everybody um, at, at all levels to try and track and deal with in terms of engaging um, at the, you know, with the government uh, around the pandemic. Some, you know, some really challenging, some very supportive. Um, I do think for once, we may finally have some people working at USDA Agricultural Marketing Service who at least want to get it right. Um, and the places where they get it wrong is largely because they don't they don't yet know. Um, and through you know the constraints of government, um, I think one of the you know we may be able to use some of these examples of what were supposed to be simplified per applications or programs to improve upon these. But it's, I mean, it is, it's a little overwhelming for everybody, us included, um, to try and keep track of all of this stuff uh, and all of the opportunities and then try and wade through um, the, the challenges of working with our, our, our federal government on them, which is, you know, part of what, you know, we try and do here at the Farmers Market Coalition is try and as much as possible make that a little bit easier. But I am, you know, it is, it's, it's definitely a challenge. So it sounds like y'all have already had a long day, um, which I, I, I totally hear. So um, what I'd like to do then is um, if I can, you know, if I can get just a little bit more of your time, what I wanna try and do is a little advocacy exercise. And the idea here is really, <clears throat> if you all have um, that idea of what you are most proud of in your work um, and, you're up for it. We can spend, you know, there's, I think we've got 15 minutes left scheduled on this session and we can just walk through what, you know, what it is like to contact your member of Congress, either by phone um, or through their, um, their form on their site. And I can give you, I'll give you a sample um, script. And let's see if I can do this right. I even have a set of PDF or linked instructions. Here we go. So, well, we can, I can walk you through it. And here's um, some instructions there in the chat. <clears throat> and if it's not today, although, you know, you do have the 15 minutes and it's plenty of time to do it and we'll walk right through it. So um, pretty easy, but you could also do this another time. So if you navigate to, oh, no, I can't get out of the chat window. Um, so if you navigate to, Congress, congress.gov slash contact us. So I'll go ahead and do that with you so you can see what, what we're doing. Um, and then within the box, you can right here, so it comes up, you can put your address in. Um, I don't have an Alaska address, but I'll just put the state. Then when I do that, it'll bring up on the next page, members of Congress, right? And you can choose who it is that you'd like to contact. So let's just say we're talking about Lisa Murkowski, for example. Um, you can see that it has address. So if you're interested in writing a letter, um, you can write a letter, uh, you can make a phone call. Uh, I would, um, encourage you to go ahead and make a phone call today. Um, that way, 
you don't have to do it another time, although doing it again is great. Um, and well, heads up on letters. Um, if you ever have urgent matters you want to communicate, um, mail to their um, Washington office is usually not a good route. All of that mail, federal mail gets inspected through a lengthy process. So it can take a little bit for them to get it. If you want to get it to them quickly, you can send it to their offices in their district. Um, so the next thing we'll do is we'll get a call script for you, but I'm just walking you through where you can see. If you prefer to email them, you can click on their name and then they won't, usually on here, you won't see their, an email address, but if you go to their website, um, <coughs> excuse me, usually got a contact button and then an email and that'll bring up the contact form, um, which as Robbie was asking, um, you know, is that okay to use? It's certainly good to use. Um, is by, if you're providing, you know, if, if general information and that's your, um, your only avenue, it never hurts. Um, if you have a direct contact for a member of Congress, um, definitely better to use that. Um, so once you've figured out who you're going to contact, what their contact information is, I now have a little script for you. Um, and on the script, this is something that you can use to reach out to your members of Congress. Um, the reason I brought up this question earlier of what it is that you're most proud of about your market and what evidence you have for it gets to this first piece in yellow. If you can explain to the member of Congress why, um, you know, why and how your work is impactful, uh, you're going to be much more effective. Members of Congress love data. They love stories. If what you have is a story, an individual example, that's your evidence. That's great. That totally works. Um, they really like to cite statistics and they really like to have stories in their back pocket that they can tell. Um, and then the other piece that for, um, for helping to really help them understand the work that you do and also to have wonderful photo ops. They also love photo ops. Um, we'd encourage you to invite them out to market or um, to your farm, to whatever work that you do so they can see it in action. It always cements the, the work really clearly and um, it helps to, um, <clears throat> it helps that the work that you all are doing is, is much more interesting than many of the invitations that they get to go to meetings or, or things like that. And then of course, if you can have a role for them in whatever activity that you're doing, that is a great and great engagement strategy. Above all else, um, our politicians do love to talk. So if they have an opportunity to talk, oh, I should say above all else, they love to talk in front of cameras. So if you can give them that opportunity, um, then you've really helped them um, feel good about, about the work that they're doing and, and give them a platform. So that's a, really all I have for you today. I would love it if I could get some commitments of folks who are gonna reach out to their members of Congress in support of, um, in particular farmers markets, but um, you can use this as the basis to develop any sort of strategy. I'm seeing a thumbs up. Um, Brian, Brad, 100, all right. So it sounds like we got some commitments. And um, yeah, unless there are other questions, we can leave this time for folks to actually do this activity, copy and paste it out of the PDF. Um, or just write it down in your own words. Um, so I'll go. I'll, I'll stick around for the next little bit for anybody who wants to chat policy. Um, but other than that, I'm done with my presentation. Well, so great, Ben. Uh, you finished under time, way under time, um, which which is really excellent because now we can open it up for you know other questions that are still on topic um, <clears throat> for this session. Um, we have about. 10 minutes left. So I would encourage everyone to, you know, do, do your uh, online homework right now, if you feel like it, or as since we still have Ben in the, in the uh, spotlight here, um, something that comes to your mind, Brad, go, man, go. <laughs> hey, uh, Ben, you want to talk a little bit about farmer's market week and that opportunity for folks in Alaska and maybe about like fly-ins and like opportunities that uh, people can actually go and talk directly to a representative or something. I'd love to hear about both of those things. Yeah, yeah. So um, as of right now, so I'll do the second one first. As of right now, there's still a lot of caution around um, 
COVID, um, although you know that may be changing um, here in the near future. So a lot of members of Congress have not been doing in-person visits. So um, that's part of why we're sort of focusing on these types of virtual opportunities um, to share your, your feedback with members of Congress, although um, that may open it up and we may have some, um, I mean, it almost certainly will, we will almost certainly um, start seeing fly-ins um, happen more regularly as we get to the farm bill. Um, so keep an eye out for that. We don't currently have plans um, for that, but um, if we do, you'll, you'll all definitely know. And then, yeah, National Farmers Market Week, um, our favorite week of the year, um, starts uh, August 7th this year. We've got um, exciting plans for it um, as usual. Um, we've been uh, our, our communications team has been hard at work developing our messaging around this year. This year, we're going to be um, sort of starting to move on from the farmers markets are essential um, wording that we've used over the last couple of years. We really feel like that uh, message has been heard and um, has laid the groundwork for um, what, what we're trying to delve into, which is this idea that farmers markets don't just happen, um, that those of you who are buying behind the scenes um, running farmers markets, selling farmers markets, um, really do a tremendous amount of work to make um, these really vital community institutions happen. Uh, and so it's, you know, this week, this year is a real focus on the role of, of market operators in particular. Um, but it is, as always, a huge celebration of um, farmers markets and all they bring to communities. It's a great time to invite members of Congress out to your communities. Um, it's also a great time to have celebrations and, and think about really um, how to engage your communities. We will be um, doing, again, we'll be, re, um, we'll be <coughs> excuse me, we're going to be bringing back our uh, farmer's market poster contest. So for those of you who might remember that, we used to do um, a contest where you could enter your favorite uh, farmer's market poster, advertising your market into a contest. Um, we're going to be doing that again. Um, and then our toolkit for National Farmers Market Week will be released in early June. That's your kind of playbook, your guidebook um, to give you that, you know, um, everything that you need really soup to nuts and how to plan a, a marketing campaign around National Farmers Market Week. Uh, it includes a proclamation template, which you all have been so successful at, um, at utilizing um, in order to get uh, that also declared Alaska Farmers Market Week. Um, so. We actually, I, speaking of which, someone asked for that or like as early as um, this week. So we'll be doing the proclamation template even earlier, but still part of the toolkit. Um, so definitely look for that coming up. Um, and again, you know, it's just it is such a fun, um, such a fun time. It's really um, a great way to see all the love that that people have for farmers markets, and it, people get real um, interesting with it. Uh, Minnesota has done some really fun celebrations with um, zucchini races and corn trucking competitions, and um, so you know, lots lots to do there too. Yeah, there we go. Okay, maybe people are just thinking about things. A lot of great information was provided. There's a lot of great links that are being saved along with the recording of this uh, presentation, which I've been told will be available for the next six months uh, once uh, things are cleared up uh, on that. Um, I see Megan uh, is, is here and she's with uh, Farmer's Market also. Megan, do you wanna, yeah, you celebrate yourself and you wanna get on, you know, Speak, girl. <laughs> Hi, I don't know what you want me to speak on. Um, I'm the local foods coordinator for the Alaska Farmers Market Association. So um, we work with the Farmers Market Coalition pretty closely. We're working on um, their new uh, what, FMP, FMPP grant together, um, which will be for um, Farmers Market Week, National Farmers Market Week this fall. So some exciting things coming there and um, just on data collection too. Yeah, so uh, 
put me on the spot, Brian, but um, if anybody has, you know, farmer's market questions, um, the Alaska Farmer's Market Association has a really robust website that we are giving a little revamp um, before the summer season and lots of good resources there, many from the Farmer's Market Coalition. Um, and we also have an online directory, which is amazing too. Uh, coming soon, I'll just give a little shameless plug since I have the spotlight for a second. Uh, we have our Alaska Farmers Markets Toolkit that will be coming out this spring, um, which is um, just a, a conglomeration of a bunch of resources we've compiled from um, other farmers market associations, from the Farmers Market Coalition, and from our market managers around the state who are established to help new farmers market managers um, have a roadmap for how to start a farmer's market in their community. So we're really hoping that that opens some doors for people and makes it feel accessible for them to um, start a farmer's market so they feel empowered to be in that leadership role. And yeah, it's very exciting. So that will be up and released uh, soon. There's a little teaser tomorrow, another shameless plug, uh, <laughs> during the lightning sessions. Um, Brian, don't ever give me the spotlight to talk. I'll just take it <laughs> over. But um, Keep on going. Keep on going. Yeah. Got, got about three minutes. We'll, we'll save the last <laughs> 60 seconds for Ben for his closing. Sure. Um, but tomorrow there's a, a very quick, just eight minute presentation during the lightning round presentations in the afternoon um, that will tease that toolkit. So if you're interested in learning a little more about what will be included in that, um, I will go over that and also give a better overview, more prepared overview of what AFMA does um, as well. So with that, Thank you for that space. Uh, thank you, Ben, for all the wonderful information too and for your partnership with us and um, continued collaboration together. Looking forward to um, the exciting things coming with your new grant as well. So thank you. Okay, uh, you get three more minutes, Ben. <laughs> then we'll close out. Yeah, um, trying to think about a little, I got three minutes song for three minutes grab the guitar no i'm just kidding um yeah well um happy to be here always um enjoy talking with you all um I, megan thank you for that I, sh I certainly should have mentioned that piece um about the exciting work that, that we're going to be doing on national farmers market week together um yeah, the last thing I'll just remind folks is um, for those of you who are working with farmers markets in Alaska, um, Alaska Farmers Market Association is a state partner of the Farmers Market Coalition. So you have access to all of the wonderful resources um, of the Farmers Market Coalition. Thanks to that at no additional cost to you. Um, the measurement and evaluation work um, that is part of uh, all of this is so critical. Um, we have spent um, the last 10 years at the Farmers Market Coalition trying to um, make the case for that. And, and I feel like we've finally gotten to a point where um, the farmers market sector, um, there's a lot of understanding of it. We're still behind where we, you know, where um, so many other parts of our world are on data. And that's about um, sort of some of some of the nature of how this all works, the decentralized, independent nature of farmers and farmers market operators. Um, and yet we're also starting to get our hands around some of the, the important ways in which we talk about our impact, both individually and collectively. And so uh, that's really been been gratifying and um, we're excited to keep doing that as, as part of our project so that we can make sure that, you know, when we talk about these government programs, we're, we're showing um, why they're important and what kind of um, activities they create on the ground um, there in Alaska or elsewhere in the country. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, drop my email in the chat in case anybody wants to contact me about policy stuff anytime. Um, but uh, very uh, happy to have had the opportunity to talk with you, and um, I think we're right on time for me to close it out. Excellent. Thanks again, Ben. Uh, really, really great presentation. Good to see you again. Um, big round of applause, everybody, virtually. Yeah. However you're supposed to do that. Yeah, I, we don't have the sound machine going, so uh, great. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Um, I believe, let me just guide everyone here. Um, I got my right screen here. I got too many screens open. Um, yes, I think we're going to break for the next 30 minutes. So get your lunch uh, or make your lunch. Um, 
check out the uh, online auction. Um, that's through Whova. And also visit the vendor booth. So I think that's about it. Uh, Megan, And did I miss anything? You got it. I would say, um, yeah, have a great lunch. Navigate back to Whova. You can find the online auction, like Ryan mentioned. Um, visit our exhibitors go in the community board and chat with each other. There's a lot of really cute animal pictures and stuff going on there um, and some really good topics being discussed too. But um, meet back at 1215 for our keynote with Eva Burke. It's going to be amazing. So you don't want to miss it.